Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, welcome back to Cannon Fodder, the channel for Arsenal fans all over this world. We've got the likely lads back again. We're going to get into that in a moment. The guy's just below me. <laughs> <laughs> Is there champagne in there? I don't think there is. No, <laughs> yeah. G -G -G. Irish tea, lads. Sorry, spiders. <laughs> you can talk to me one of those shows. Yeah, the Canon Project is back. I think it's the sixth instalment of the Canon Project. We've got James Rowe. I've got some questions to ask him about a particular director of football out there in Ajax and uh, some other bits oh. and pieces about um, Arsenal. Yeah, Arsenal. But we're getting this one on the other side of this music intro. Oh, I can't wait for this one. Yes, welcome back to Cannon Fodder. Yes, the channel for Arsenal fans literally all over this world. We've got James Rowe just next door to me, Amsterdam. And just to the other side, we've got the guys, just my neighbours, just over there in Ireland. <laughs> guys. Hey, anyway, anyway um, make sure you guys subscribe. Please help us to grow organically, if that word exists in cyberspace. But I can't wait to get into this one. So, James, how are you, my friend? How are you? Very well, thank you, Alex. Nice to be back on. I've had a nice um, couple of hours. I was very fortunate to speak to um, former England international Terry Fennick early on this afternoon. And it was um, very interesting to hear about his time at Queen's Park Rangers playing for England and coming up against uh, one of the greatest to ever play the game in his pomp in Diego Maradona. So feeling very good and um, onwards and upwards, as they say. Brilliant, brilliant, James. Now to the likely lads. Uh, you've got two cameras. Which one shall I choose? <laughs> a bigger one, I'd say. Go, go for Tim's one. It's bigger than my phone. All right. Okay. If, if I can go for that. Oh, I can't go. You're can growing I... organically, as you said. Hey! 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 <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? Is it on off? No, 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 what happened? You're holding up a cup. What happened, guys? No, this is this is Tim's really. Yeah, well, no, it's giant. It's all a giant. <laughs> giant, <laughs> giant. Tim is the top man, uh, uh, trainer, selector, the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, the 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 both the Mark Overmars and the Arsene Wenger oh. and uh, Unai Emery <laughs> and the Arteta of uh, <laughs> the whole lot rolled into one. <laughs> Uh, even Stan Kroenke. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And basically, uh, we've got two lovely little places. One is called Scarif Town, the other one, Ogonolo Village. And uh, we were in a county final. They worked all their way through, the team did. And Tim was a fantastic coach and trainer. And they got to the county final. We, we had to go down to this massive ground called Clonlara down near, near Limerick. Very serious final. Photographers are there. Big crowd of people, program sellers, the, the uh, whole lot. And uh, we scored a goal and a point within two minutes. Oh, yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. Two minutes. And we were we were trouncing them. But suddenly, it all went a bit wrong, a bit <laughs> peak tong. And we were, we, uh, we're at the, the second water break. There was, a, it was almost at the second water break. We were almost only three points ahead. And then one lad called Luke, I think it was, yeah, scored, yeah, sneaked, scored, in. sneaked in a goal, sneaked in a goal, and suddenly we were six points ahead again, and we finished the game seven points and ahead. Some, like that, so, yeah. uh, so the team now, this is the cup, hey. Hey. and uh, they are the champions of Clare for for, for under thirteen. There you go. Well done, brilliant. Thank you. Thank well, you. Done, well done. Thank well you. done. Well done. Well done. Uh, okay, let's get to some um, some sense of um, craziness. There's no normality on Canon 4 TV. No, 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 no. Craziness over here. 
within the um, within the the hour, the last hour, I've heard some news in regards to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. He's apparently been um, sacked. Yeah, uh, yeah, by uh, Manchester United. Uh, I know that we'll probably get into that maybe towards the end if we have time. Yeah, they were beaten five now, quite convincingly by uh, Liverpool. I saw the game, and um, yeah, it would have been very difficult for um, Source Guy to actually survive after that. Mm. Uh, James, do you want to say anything quickly about Source Guy, or shall we move on? Well, I I thought it was going to happen when you get fairly beaten by uh, your rivals in such a manner at your own stadium in front of your own fans i think you can expect such a reaction but i don't know if anybody saw the highlights of the game or the game yesterday but i thought it's mohammed salah's goal i thought it was an amazing goal it look he makes it look extremely simple but i think it's one of the best goals i've seen in a long time so uh, well done to him well done to liverpool and um i must say for everyone on twitter who likes to consider themselves a um an expert in the real world of football, which I deal in, um, the small details at the highest level make the biggest difference. So Manchester United are going to have to take their time and make sure they get the right man for the job. And um, I think it'll be a very long, very drawn out process. Yeah. Uh, guys, like, lads, any any thoughts on uh, Ole Gunnar Sky Sky? Well, yeah. I, as an Arsenal fan, I was hoping they'd keep him in in place <laughs> because we played him in a few weeks' time, and uh, I was so. But also, an, an interesting talking point might be: when's the last time an EPL manager fe- fell on his sword? When's the last time a manager said, "No, that's it. I can't. I can't do this." All they do is they wait for the big payoff because the contract is paid is paid out right to the end, and so done, yeah. and so they can go on a beach somewhere. Uh, in Dubrovnik or wherever they want to go, yeah. and uh, they they can say thank you very much. I'm crying all the way to the uh, bank in Dubrovnik. Yeah, very good. Yeah, uh, yeah. Go on, Tim. Sorry, go on, Tim. Yeah, yeah, no, just I saw it. I watched. No, actually, uh, my son here watched all of it. But he watched, and he was. I was trying to tidy up wrong, and he kept texting me, and it was two and three and four and five. But anyway, of course, by the time I sat down, it was about four and nil, and um, just after half time. And he got, they got the goal, right? And I sat down and watched the last half hour of it. They were literally playing with them. They were, there's no word of a lie. They were playing. And I watched, I read this thing about positional play there last month or so. And maybe actually with you, Terry. Yeah, I think it was, We yeah, were talking yeah. about it. And we were saying that a lot of positional play, they repeat the, they repeat the triangle, they repeat it. And that's all they were doing. They were just keeping the ball, repeating the old uh, position. The little, they were just murdering them. In other words, they were saying... Look, we could get another two if we wanted, but we feel we've enough done. We have a match probably next week. We're getting ready for. And like the one thing I will say is that the Liverpool manager that didn't sign up Mo Salah a month ago, or the Liverpool board, I should say, my God, they're going to pay well for it now because they're talking about Ballon d'Or. They're talking about he's moved to a different level. Like he's he's and the thing about him is, which everyone I think would nearly say was a factor for us on uh, Friday night was. His work rate and his example, I mean, we saw, I think what we saw Friday night from Lacazette is, example, he worked hard, other players around him had to buy in, that was it, he sets the tone, Mo Salah does that, and let's be honest, Mo Salah is on a, on a plane above, well, nearly above everyone at this stage, but you know, that's the way it is, he sets the tone, he wants to win, he, and another thing, which I, I'll, I'll let you go back now, sorry uh, for taking over, eyes, but he, he never gets injured. He's yeah. always playing. Yeah. That's a good yeah. point. He's always playing. He's always just That's hungry for goals. That is a really good point. Really good yeah. point. Yeah. So okay. let's take it all the way back to Monday. Monday, oh. James. We got one point and I predicted a 2-2 draw against Crystal Palace. And still people are thinking, oh, we've got our Arsenal back. We've got our Arsenal back. Really? No, I haven't seen any um, upward turn at Arsenal. James, your thoughts? I think it's very much a sign of the times. Um, we beat Aston Villa and people are talking about Saliba. Saliba plays for the biggest club in France when he didn't get any further than the under-23s. It's highly unlikely that he's going to return to Arsenal. So Arsenal win a game of football, Saliba goes out on loan and with Ganduzi has a great game and they are relishing playing for the biggest football club in France. You can see that on both of them, there's an added maturity. 
And then Arsenal Twitter like to say, oh, it's really exciting to see him in red and white next year. We won't see him in red and white next year. I think we'll see him in light blue and white and he'll remain at Marseille with an, with an option to buy. If you are a young player and you have been sold dreams of grandeur where you trade St Etienne in for Arsenal and you don't get further than the under 23s and you're not looked after and you're kind of left to fend for yourself playing abroad in a different country with a different language. And then all of a sudden, you go back to your homeland to play for the biggest club in that country. You're not going to want to leave, are you? But the Arsenal fans on Twitter always know he'll be back next year. It's highly unlikely he's going to be back next year. The Aston Villa result reminds me very much of the Tottenham result, where one swallow makes a summer, one win and everything is all right. The goal we conceded, which was a fantastic finish by Jacob Ramsey, brilliant finish. If you see the tackle, the the inept tackle that Thomas Partey tried to put in on Leon Bailey, I had to watch it back three times to try to find out what is he trying to do? What is he trying to do? Lukonga had a great uh, opportunity, skied it high and wide. But our fans love to jump on the, the win, the here and now, and that's going to change everything. We haven't won a league title for what will be 18 years. Manchester United have sacked their manager. We give our current manager, who's learning on the job, time, respect, money. You know, Emery never received any of this. You know, Emery had Raul Yelly coming into his change room, battering down his door. But Arteta's not experiencing that, is he? And I, I'm really starting to believe, particularly the younger generation of Arsenal fans, we are getting a reputation as a fan base where we are our own worst enemy. If we win one particular game, it heralds a brave new world. But then we drop points against Brighton and Crystal Palace. And therefore, we're back to this is our team for this week. We're not acting like a big club. And I, for one, with William Saliba, would you leave Marseille to return to Arsenal? No, you wouldn't, would you? And no matter how many likes or retweets or my G comments there are, it's not going to change anything. As a club, I maintain that we are going through the motions. We're not acting like a big club. We're acting like everything's about the past. Everything's about the name. I'm even having Dutch colleagues in the Netherlands saying that to me, where, you know, what, why is the club living in the past? Why is the club always talking about the past? Why are they not putting things in place for the future? But... We will learn the hard way. For those that think about Champions League and Europa League, OK, let them think that. But um, I can't see us playing in Europe this year. I think it will be sporadic wins every now and again, and that will be that. But you, you can't talk about these things through fear of being negative on social media accounts. Uh, so I always like to think I let my interviews do the talking. I had today an interview with a former international player, Terry Finnick, who had to man mark one of the greatest to ever play the game in his pomp. And for him to be so honest with me about what he experienced both on and off the pitch, it just goes to show. And I think a lot of Arsenal fans, not on this channel, not on uh, the, the fantastic podcast we've got, but I think as, a, as Arsenal Twitter, for example, it's always come like, become like a parody. Uh, to quote yeah. the great Dave Chappelle, one of the greatest comedians of all time, Twitter is not a real place. It's not a real place in the real world, so I couldn't care less. And I think he's spot on. And I often say to many Dutch colleagues here in the Netherlands, where I live, our fan base used to be so respectful, used to be so thoughtful, used to be so in the know. And it's kind of diluted to where the younger generation, it's all about them and what they think. You provide facts, you provide examples. They're not interested in any of that. They'll pick out one particular word and that will be what they run with. I don't know where they went to school, but honestly, it's very much a sign of the times. But as I said last season, as I said the season before and the season before that, until a new owner comes in with a new ethos who actually puts Arsenal first, the will to want to win trophies then I, I really can't see things changing. So you can beat Tottenham, you can beat you can beat Aston Villa. We'll probably um we'll probably might win in the coming weeks against opponents that we face, but um doesn't change the fact that as a club we're going through the motions. 
James, final question before I go to the likely lads. Uh, would you put money on Arsenal finishing in the top 10 positions? Yeah, uh, no. No, no but I, I've had to be... Um, I've had to be very quiet about what I think due to... I've, I've had to be very quiet about what I think due to abuse on social media. And for those that follow me, and have followed me for years, they'll notice that I don't put my opinion out like I used to on my timeline because what I received was nothing short of horrific. So now, as for some, they might find it sad. For some, you will only hear my opinion on podcast form when you hear what comes out of my mouth. And you can only read my interviews on my timeline. And I, I like to think that my interviews will do the talking. I, I refer to Alan Smith, one of the greatest strikers this club's ever had. He could have gone to Chelsea. He could have gone to Manchester United. But he told me, James... I looked at Arsenal, I looked at George Graham, I looked at the players, and I thought, this is a this is a club and a manager who's going places, and I want to be part of it. Now, it's a scattergun, completely scattergun approach, where we appear to have got lucky with Ramsdale, appear to get to have got lucky with Ramsdale. But again, one swallow doesn't make a summer. So I just think that, as a club, it's kind of like a parody of our, of our former selves, you know. And, and I just think that, um, you know, we'll learn the hard way. We will learn the hard way, unfortunately. Daniel Day Lewis, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I just, yeah, I, I like, um, I just, and I don't want to be Joe uh, argumentative or anything, but I, I uh, would kind of slightly differ with that in the sense that last year, um, I remember, like last year, you know, there was good days and bad. There's no point in saying there wasn't. Uh, I remember the two two best players we had were uh, Tierney and Saka. I would say if I was to pick a player of the season or player top two for the season last year, they were obviously uh, kind of an attacking midfield, attacking kind of a winger almost, in Sa- and a fullback obviously in Tierney. So they were kind of you know, they were keeping us afloat. They were really we were pumping above our weight. With Smith Rowe, Odegaard, I suppose, actually was a player. They were the players that were that were kind of, you know, they were catching the eye and maybe getting the odd good result that we had. Now, going back to this year, I remember, like, we were on here about a month ago or whatever, and um, now I was badly caught out since, I have to say. But I, I, I said that uh, Sambi Lakonga, like, to me, he looked like something that was exciting. He looked, you see, I'm not anti Jacka because. The reason I'm not anti Jacka is that if you're in a boat and you've only a small oar, you still have a small oar. No, it's better than no oar. So that, that's the way to look at life. And like I felt that our middle, like uh, I know Thomas Patrick kind of comes up for conversation and there's he's a transitional midfielder, but ultimately, whatever he is, he's definitely not a box to box midfielder. He's definitely not that anyway. He's not, he hasn't got the, the energy, he hasn't got the legs, he doesn't yeah. stand, he just doesn't have that. While uh, Jacka was kind of fulfilling that role. Look, he very much divided uh, Arsenal supporters on um, on social media. But I think Sam Bilakonga the other night, what I saw of him the other night, I was impressed. He was covering the ground. He was up and down the field. He was giving us that platform. Now, I would agree uh, that we we uh, that that with one thing I would definitely agree with James on is that my secretary were watching the match and it was great. We great, great hall crack. Uh, Watching the game with our our, our our significant others were with us, but uh, there was a thing on beforehand, and uh, there I don't want to name those people. But there was three people. They were kind of I'd say very uh, they were very active in social media, uh, and they were interviewed in the old Highbury, just as you went into the old Highbury. And uh, two of them now were very knowledgeable. I have to say they gave a great insight. They talked about Arteta, where the club was going, and there was another the third person then. Um, made a comment about, oh, Arsenal haven't won anything in whatever, 80, 17, or whatever number of years. And I said, but you're Arsenal have won FA Cups, like, you know? <laughs> I mean, and I'm like, I'm like I, I, we had a bad, bad, bad result here in our house the, the day of the Man City match. And uh, as Terry would testify, I have a teenager that takes this far too seriously. He needs to relax <laughs> a lot more in life. But anyway, he said, he, my teacher was not happy after Man City beating us 5-0. And Terry immediately consoled him. He said, look, we won the FA Cup. 
a couple of years ago. I went to Tottenham win it last. And I remember at the time, it was like, oh my God, it was, it was like with a blanket around him. So like, success is relative. With the youngest team, I think now in the Premier League, yep. we have um, a combination in that, look, whether it, well, look, we we'll talk about Gabriel and White with Lukonga and Partey in front of them. Uh, that four look like they are going to give us a foundation or a platform, transitioning the bar up. And ultimately, Lacazette has done what, what players find always hard to do. He has reinvented himself. He's got into that kind of more of a deeper role, a kind of a playmaking role. And I was really impressed with him. I was actually more impressed with him than I was with Smith Rowe, but I was delighted with Smith Rowe in the match now. He played very well too. But so I would kind of say that we're not going to look, I, 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 we're not going to be challenged for the league. There's no point in saying we are. But we, the profile of the team is reasonably good. That young fullback was good actually as yeah. well. Yeah. So there was, I think there's positives. Look, but I would say you have to kind of cut your clock to measure with the player, with the team. Not even with the squad, with the team we have at the moment, it's going to be transitional. It's going to be a developmental season, and we kind of have to maybe just be be, be hesitant in kind of maybe knocking lads back a bit too much. But I do understand that people have to be criticised on performances and things like. That. No, sorry, Terry, I jumped in. No, there. I was just going to say about Saliba. Going back to the Saliba thing uh, and comparing uh, Graham Potter, who's got a master's degree in emotional intelligence mm-hmm. and how to how to lead groups of people and teams we have a, a guy whose name escapes me but he's in charge of uh, loans and when we when we bought Saliba he was 17 years of age so he could have been in a sixth form in a in a London primary school uh, secondary school and uh, he lost his uh, mum I think it was and then Sali- and then his team St Etienne got to the the French F- FA Cup final or the equivalent of now uh, in any secondary school that I know, if somebody in the sixth form or anywhere in the school or primary school loses a parent, the whole of the staff meet, they discuss how to support that, that person. There's all kinds of things put into place to help things. And Arsenal did exactly the opposite. They said to him, uh, because the loan period for, for the rest of that season finished the day before the French Cup final, Arsenal said, you can't play in it. And this is his home club. He played there since he he was a young lad. All they had to do was say, of course you can. And of course, they they would have retorted with, but if he'd have got injured, you'd have said something different. Well, no, because if I was the guy in charge of loans, I would have said, looking after our players, and in particular, our younger players, is key. And what, how do you want to destroy a 17-year-old who loses his, his mum, gets his team to the cup final, which they've not been in in probably several decades, and then say, because of one day, you can't perform in your, in your local club's cup final. That's just gross incompetence. I think in a school, you'd be facing the sack if you did something as abysmally lacking in empathy and really common sense. So I do feel sorry for Saliba. And I I, do, I have watched him and he has come on in leaps and bounds. But I'm a bit worried that James might be right. And I'm a bit worried that Saliba won't be back, either because the club have given up on him or m- more likely he's given up on Arsenal. And that might be yet another massive error. The last one being Emi Martinez. So... Um, our club is not being run well. They haven't got... I mean, clubs now have an enormous backroom team, and quite rightly so. Well, can we please have somebody in there who's uh, who has some knowledge of how you deal with players' in, in emotions and feelings and maturity or lack of it and so on, so that when you get a Gwen, Gwen Doozy go off the handle, don't... Don't challenge him in front of everybody. There, there are ways of doing this, you know. And um, I'm sorry. I mean, we're all big Arsenal fans here. But we seem to be just bumping into bits of furniture like a drunk man in a room. Just get some people who know how to work with, with young people and make sure you can smooth their transition. I think it was Wenger I was listening to the other day saying, up, up, at the age of 14... You've got a good idea as to to whether a player has the the required skill set. And then for the next three years, 
you're looking at how they develop physically and emotionally and all of that. There's a whole thing out there of doing that right. And we seem to be not doing that right. In fact, I've, only, I've heard recently that they've talked to um, uh, Neil Smith Rowe about his uh, diet. Well, it's always been, been pretty obvious to me that he's carrying about a, a stone extra for, for a young lad, you know. And uh, they've obviously had to sort that out. Well, that should have been sorted out long before. And suddenly he's running faster. Nobody can get near him. Was it J Jamie Carragher or somebody said he's the best player in the EPL for, for running at breakneck speed towards the goal. So Arsenal, look at your backroom team. If they're not good enough, put out an advert, get people in who know how to deal with the emotional side of players. Guys, I mean, Tim and his team will do this with the, the young lads they're playing, because you can't be running a team without bearing in mind how the players are feeling. You're not just looking at legs run, running around the pitch. These are human beings and you can get the best out of them if you approach them the sort of right way and support them correctly. Um, Tim, I want to go back to Tim very, very quickly before I go to James. Uh, Tim, do you think Arsenal have benefited um, from not being in uh, European football for this season? <laughs> Alex, that is the best statement you've made in the last two weeks, I'd say. That, <laughs> hey! Thank you. <laughs> that is it. Because I will tell you, young players, young players, training, lifestyle changes, hopping on planes, flying to Eastern Europe, mm. uh, coming back in the middle of the night, going into kind of irregular uh, into structure. I mean, look, we all, I, I remember when I was in college and all things, the only thing that progressed most people through college, people say it's your academic ability. It is, maybe. But, uh, the, but the big thing is structure, rigor and structure. If you can put people in an environment where they're training four days a week, they're, you get a chance to, they get a chance to rest, they're working towards uh, their big... I mean, ultimately, Arsenal had a bad start to the season, those horrific couple of first couple of matches. Brentford have turned out to be, look, maybe not so bad. They've, they've definitely, they've caught, they've, they've caught more than Arsenal. Uh, but ultimately, those big, big defeats. Then, we got our house in order, put our defence in place. And, like, uh, now, been, we have been lucky with our injuries. Saka, Smith-Rowe, uh, so some of these, of these players have really uh, been, you know, they've been very inj they've been injury free, really. And, like, it goes back to what like I was saying about Mo Salah earlier, is that the really good players that's the thing about them. They're nearly all injury free, injury free. They're whatever. Is it preparation? Is it mental drive? Is it just that desire that I want to get a goal? I want to play. Like Smith Rowe is releasing quotes now. And if I was his agent, I'd be saying, stop talking. <laughs> uh, because he's like, he said, oh, I love Arsenal. I want to spend all my career at Arsenal. I got the goal the other night. Like, and you know, I, he was all about Joe. You know, that this was a team goal. I worked for the team. We got the match. We got the win. He didn't care. Like, like he was just delighted to score, but he was delighted to be on a winning Arsenal team. And you know, that sort of enthusiasm is infectious. Like, I mean, mm. I was looking at that and I was kind of saying, Jesus Christ, wouldn't you love to see uh, a young fella like that? Sorry about the bang name. Uh, wouldn't you love to see a player that's just so enthused by the setup? He sees the value of what he's doing. Saka and him, and uh, if they can, they, I think they could have done a bit, by the way, to set this tone. I mean, I see uh, Lacazette is getting a lot of praise, which I'm delighted for now, by the way, but he's gonna, you know, he's setting a very good tone. The tone, I think the tone could partially be set by those younger players. Yeah. And Lacazette himself could be buying into it. I think it's not all it's not all the older players. And like Aubameyang, in fairness to him, that combination with himself and Lacazette, I didn't think it was good. I Look, I wasn't pro it, but it did work together nice. Maybe uh, they'd have to be fluid about it. Wouldn't have to come to you. But ultimately, Lacazette tries hard, works hard, but he's not a big player. Like he's not a big man. But mm. like, hey, we, we you have to you have to. But ultimately, getting game time into young players is a big, big thing because ultimately they have to improve. And 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 like you're saying, rest, being being involved in the Europa League or whatever it's called now, has limited value for young players. If you could consolidate your, like, I mean, really talk about top ten. I'd say Arsenal are going to finish. Well. Um, give me another 20 minutes. I've got a number on there, <laughs> James. <laughs> well, I think both um, Daniel and Terry make some great points to elaborate a little bit more on Saliba. Who was his partner at St. Etienne? Wesley Fofana, and he Fofana. played in that cup final. 
and Wesley Fofana. Saliba leaves before Saliba leaves before Fofana, and but yeah, it's Fofana who's made the progress. Work that one out. And um, Saliba left for Arsenal and didn't get further than the under 23s. And uh, Fofana leaves for Saint Le- for Leicester, goes on to win an FA Cup. So it just goes to show. Uh, viewers who watch me on Canon Fodder and read my interviews, they know that obviously my ambition is to work on the media side of a professional football club. But I am really intrigued about the position of loan manager because young players particularly, and I've spoken to so many, when they go abroad, for the, and I'll repeat it, for the umpteenth, umpteenth time for the viewers that still don't quite grasp this, when a young player leaves for foreign climes, for the first time in their life, they're often living independently for the first time. They're learning life skills, learning to cook, learning to clean, learning to look after themselves. The club becomes your family. And as regards to Smith Rowe, I spoke to Harry Tofolo, who plays um, for Huddersfield Town. They played together last season. Harry Tofolo said to me, James, he's a brilliant player and he's starting to come to the fore. But what many people do not know is that Monaco were looking at him when he was out of favour at Arsenal and they came, they came close to presenting a bid. Aston Villa is still a big football club. They're not a small football club. They've won a European Cup. We haven't. If you know, if you people want to be um, funny about it, but we just appear, as, as Terry says, to lurch from one to the other, where one victory makes everything all right. I'll repeat it once again. Bayern Munich don't act like that. Ajax don't act like that. Juventus don't act like that. Nor do Real Madrid. Why? Because winning is ingrained in the culture. You know, it's been 18 years since we last won a league title. You've got some fans pointing out, oh, the FA Cup is nothing. Complete rubbish. Complete rubbish. But there are some fans who only view the Champions League and the Premier League as the major trophies. They've never seen Arsenal win the League Cup. It was the first trophy I ever saw Arsenal win. So the whole fan base, you've got the older generation that know of George Graham, Arsene Wenger. You've got the younger generation that only knew Arsene Wenger and now Arteta and Unai Emery. But I think the self-service nature is the most worrying thing, where so long as they get that um, direct contact with a player, so long as they get that like or that retweet, so long as they get that reply back, in the real world, it, it doesn't work like that. I had to wait an awful long time to get my interview with Terry Fenwick over the line. And I'm a professional fo- interviewer for footballers all over the world. But I still had to wait a long, long time. But I mean, the fruits of the loins is today is, is to hear some amazing things and some amazing stories about Sir Bobby Robson and Terry Venables and, and, and that game against Maradona's um, Argentina in 86, which transcends football. But it's all about remaining patient. It's not about the, the likes and the retweets and the clout and that kind of thing. And I feel that our fan base is, is slowly coming away from what actually goes on on the pitch, where some of them think, particularly the younger generation, so long as I support that player, that's all right. But what about the collective? What about the collective of them actually winning a trophy? What about the collective of, of having a playing style? I live in a city where... Ajax is Amsterdam, and Amsterdam is Ajax, as a wise Amsterdam I once told me. And they are steamrolling every single opponent, steamrolling them. PSV of 5 0, Borussia Dortmund 4 0, in the same week, in the same week, in the same stadium, in the same city, with a huge um, style of play. And the whole city is absolutely jumping in the metros, in, in the. Um, on the streets, OK, we've got COVID measures which are soon to be sharpened yet again. But you can feel it. I just feel with Arsenal, it's just... I, I, I think it's become self-serving. And I'm going to say something now which might shock an awful lot of, of people. Being a professional football interviewer like I am, I love it. It's the best thing and the, prou- the pride to have treated every single professional the same. But travel is a huge part of my life. I haven't been to football. My last football match was at El Zaragoza against Deportivo La Coruña in March 2020. Passion, passion for football is, is, is waned a little bit, where travel is also a massive part of my life. But if you say to me in terms of the future of, of, of looking at my football club, I think, well, I don't know if I've had my time a little bit. And what I mean by that is I'm not going to stop being a supporter, 
but the the drive to go above and beyond and get a flight back from Amsterdam to London four or five game four or five times a season to take in a game, it's it's not really there because I'm surrounded by people where as long as they get that selfie, as long as they show that player support with a retweet, as long as they take that photo as soon as a, a free kick's lined up, or they get that selfie, you just think half of them are not even concentrating on what goes on on the pitch. It's all about the, the flogging or it's all about the, the YouTube generation. And I just think I'm, I'm not that old, but I start to think to myself, oh, I'm maybe getting a bit too old for, for that kind of way of things. I'm a little bit old school, like, like with Terry Fennick today. Uh, you know, it was brilliant to acknowledge with Terry Fennick that I knew that Malcolm Allison trained and managed sport in Lisbon. Everybody knew M M Malcolm Allison from Manchester City, from Crystal Palace. Everybody knew that. But it was great to share knowledge with an English ex-professional international player that you know certain things. Obviously, the younger generation now have to have to look it up, unfortunately. <laughs> That's James. Well done. Well <laughs> said. Um, we're going to go into the live chat. Um, but I've got a little message to, to, to say to actually Daniel Day-Lewis and uh, El Toro, original godfather. Um, I've, I had some comments on the morning show and for some reason, people were talking about the old Irish core of Arsenal players who played at Arsenal. Mm -hmm. And um, they want us to do like a special segment oh, on good. all the Irish players who ever played for Arsenal. So yeah. at some stage, guys, we've got to get together and do yeah. a special segment about Liam Brady, Frank Stapleton, O'Leary, and such and such. So would you guys be down for that? Would you be happy yeah, to do yeah, that? Oh, yeah. yeah. And Eddie, Eddie, Eddie was the last one, didn't he? Brilliant. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant. All right, let's go into the live chat for the first time this evening. And the assembly says, good evening, gentlemen. They're not talking about hey. me. Good evening. Uh, Noah says, um, hello, lads. Uh, who should win the Ballon d'Or? Tell. <laughs> That's, a That's a big one. Again, you're going to have to plead the fifth on that. <laughs> That's a very big question. Don't know. There's five or six good candidates, I suppose, but I, 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 I'm James. Who do you think? I'm, I'm very kind of more sad at the moment. I'm very, I'm yeah, very calm form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, okay. and he has that 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 little bit of you know, like Messi and Ronaldo when they had it. They kind of had it. They were playing a game within a game. You know, they were they were sorry. They were playing a level above. It's like they were to see things and make things happen, and, and he barely able to do that now. It's like he's able to just, you know, I'll get a goal, I need a goal, I'll work through it, I'll make it happen. And it, now, whether that's perception or whether it's reality, sometimes I don't know. And actually, something that James said earlier, uh, he reminded me of there, a very good... I remember in 86 in the World Cup final, and, uh, like, look, I in my eyes, Maradona was the best. Like, there was never... There'll never be another. I didn't see Pele, but Maradona was just unbelievable. But I remember that day. Uh, the, in, if you ever, if you ever remember, they lined up. The two teams lined up, and obviously the, they came to Maradona, and he kind of was looking. His head is slightly elevated, and he was looking up like, and it was the look of a man that today there's no one going stopping me. Like there is no one going to. And it kind of Mo Salah has. I won't say he has that, but he has maybe a little bit of that. You know, he has a that that kind of like. I'm I, I'm here and just it's it, the best you can hope for is second place because I'm going to control this. Yeah, I was going to say he's got. Of course, Klopp is the perfect manager, and Klopp's away uh, the position, as they call it, is to circulate the ball between midfield and attack. So there's going to be continual chances, whereas uh, um, Guardiola. Does a similar game, but he likes to circulate the ball, and if they lose it, they like to to get it and then put it amongst the back four and then bring it forward. So you don't quite get the same kind of yeah. constant chances. And Salah is in the form of his yeah. life, and uh, yeah, I, I, I would agree with him there. Yeah. If you were going to put it to one player now that seems to be the best in world football, well, so I would say him. Yeah, yeah, James, you want to say something, James? Well, first and foremost, it's a team game. You know, there's 11, 11 men on that pitch. It's not always just one. But, of course, the award is what it is. I think a lot of people will 
you know, say, oh, Messi's won however many and Ronaldo's won. It appeared to only be have been shared between those two. And people may remember Fabio Cannavaro winning it in 2006. But for me, I'm yeah. not going to give any names. I'm, I'm just going to let people say that it's I'm just going to say to viewers, you know, it's a team game. And, and once again, you know, if there are players that people really like, you know, go and follow their careers and, and shout about how good they are. I mean, everybody knows how good um, Mohamed Salah is. But I thought that goal against Manchester United, I thought it was brilliant. He made it look just so easy. And you can tell, uh, that Daniel made a great point about the, the contract situation with Salah. You can tell the pressure's off him now. If the pressure's off in a little bit where it doesn't really matter to him what happens. You know, I know he's extremely religious and I don't know if that's helping the fact of acceptance of that he may well move on from Liverpool. But I hope that he, I personally hope that he goes to Real Madrid because I think Real Madrid, not that I'm trying to, um, to um, advance marketing, but Africa is a continent within football which is, remains untapped. And there's, there's so many stories coming out of that continent. And you're, you're, you're only going to get coverage when it comes to the African Cup of Nations. And if you look, yeah. some people view this on here, the younger generations, if I say the name George Ware, they might not know who he is. Well, yeah. But the man's, li- the, man's life, the man's life should be turned into a film, in, in my yeah. opinion, you know, in terms yeah. of what he, what he went through. And when you look at the, the different countries in Africa, as well with Egypt and Ivory Coast and Ghana, you know, I know there'll be a lot of coverage when it comes to the African Cup of Nations, but there's a huge, there's this, it's just an untapped continent. There's a great book out as well. I read it about five, six years ago now. The author's name escapes me, but it's called The Feet of the Chameleon. And it goes through all the different countries in Africa and how they approach the game. You know, one harbors very much about the the physical side, the other one believes in uh, in, the, in the voodoo black magic. And it's, re- it's really, really interesting. And I, I, I remember my interview with Stephen Constantine, who managed Malari, when he was saying that, the, that there were so many problems behind the scenes that the players slept in dormitories. They didn't sleep in hotels, they slept in dorms. And he had to go out into the local community to raise money to get mosquito nets because mosquito was a huge problem in, uh, in Malawi. So and a mosquito malaria being a huge problem in, in Malawi as well. So this is what I mean about the the football education that you try to provide for, to people. I know it goes over a lot of people's heads, especially on social media. But every time I'm on I'm on kind of product, I like to kind of drop little snippets here and there and and hope that people enjoy it. Uh, Gary's in the the, the chat. He says, uh, uh, "Hello, hello, hello, Alex and the uh, panel." Um, here's an interesting one actually from the assembly. He says. I remember Clive Allen coming to Arsenal. So do I. It was a um, peculiar signing. In the end, we got Kenny Sampson. I've been trying to work out why we brought him because it doesn't seem to be, yeah, to play for Arsenal. Tell, do you remember when we signed Clive Allen? Yeah, I do. We signed <laughs> him at the start of the summer transfer window. And um, I remember Kenny Sampson playing for us, playing against us um, for Crystal Palace. And I'd never seen a guy with his legs as powerful. I used to stand down at the clock end, but at the side where the police band was. And uh, he came in and took a couple of throw-ons. And I remember looking up at him in, in, in the Crystal Palace jersey, and he was some powerful guy. So anyway, we decided we'd, we'd make a bid, and we brought in Clive Allen from QPR. Um, and he was a kind of a goal scorer, but he didn't do a lot else other than score goals. And obviously Terry Neal at the time thought, uh, and Don Howe thought, oh, we've we've this this isn't working. They tried him out in a few, a few preseason games, and then I think we broke the the the, the uh, transfer record for him. And then before he'd played a proper game for Arsenal, he'd been swapped for uh, Cl- for uh, Kenny Sanson. So, and I did uh, <laughs> for my sins. I I still do have a few Tottenham fans <laughs> as friends or acquaintances, shall I say? And they did. I remember one guy, Mike Pottington, saying to me that he did, of course, score. Um, I think he scored something like forty nine goals in in one season. And I said to to this friend of mine, a teaching colleague, I said, uh, 
what happened then? Were you? Did, did you reckon you got the better end of the deal? And he said, "Not really." He said because he did not. He didn't do much the season or two before. Then everything went right for him for a season, and he got tappings and all kinds of stuff. And then, and then the following season, he was back back to normal. But uh, yeah, it, it was a strange transfer. Uh, of course, nowadays they do hundreds, uh, three hundred page dossiers on each player they're thinking of buying. Um, so uh, they shouldn't get make errors, but of course they do. Like M Emmy Martinez going, I mean, you know, he he was one of our own. He was with us for ten years, I think. And yeah. uh, how we couldn't work out that the, the the guy was a top quality goalkeeper, I I will never know. Um, so yeah, I, I do do remember that. But Kenny Kenny has had his health problems, and uh, I think he got a hammer so in some back street. He got involved in a fight or something, and he was. He was hospitalised and all of that. So, and then he's had health problems, but he's come through. He looked quite well. He 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 was at the yeah. Crystal Palace match, I think, and has come through it. He's uh, a lovely fella, and uh, that ge generation of players did, did did us proud. You know, when uh, we weren't in this crazy transfer market that that we're currently in. Um, Johnny Wong says uh, uh, Romero uh, left the Champions League club for Spurs. So why wouldn't Saliba, who we already own, come back to Arsenal, Tim. Well, I think I think um, James has made a very valid point there. And, and if people want to know why he wouldn't, why did Odegaard come to Arsenal? So he <laughs> came because he was playing well. He was in a team. He was with Real Madrid. You know, they're the big there, as everyone says, Real Madrid are the... I even see someone uh, recently, a, a former schoolmate of my own, he works as a journalist in uh, Spain, and uh, he reckons that Real Madrid have the, how would I say, they've got the ear of the present Barcelona um, uh, owner or chairman. So in other words, they, there's a lot of, uh, they, that 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 club is still the major powerhouse. I think sure they won yesterday, they bet Barcelona yesterday. So like, he, was, he was really dining at the top table of European football, and next thing he appears in Arsenal. Why is he here? Because Arsenal were giving him game time. He was buying in. He was a central figure. Now he was a central figure last Friday night, but that's the that's the nature of football. You're a squad player. You have to take your role. What you have to you know you have to adapt for whatever the manager deems uh, appropriate on the day. But like that's the reason he came to Odegaard came to us because he liked the environment and he felt that it was going to be better for him in the long term. Saliba is the same. He's in Marseille now. He's a central figure. He's down there. He's probably getting, you know, a real lot of game time against good players. He's being successful. So that's that's it. Like the, it cuts both ways. We've had the benefit of it in Odegaard. We're going to look possibly have the downside of it in Saliba. The only thing with Arsenal and maybe I'm being overly nostalgic here, or maybe, but it's still Arsenal, still Arsenal. Uh, Joe, it's still the Premier League. It's big matches. Uh, Joe, you're talking about playing against the best, some of the best players and maybe even some of the best teams in the world. Like, I mean, last year's uh, Champions League final was uh, Chelsea versus Man City. So you those sort of matches, maybe. I wonder, outside of Paris Saint-Germain, would you have anyone of that real upper echelons European football in France? Now, maybe I'm being flippant there. I know Lille and Lyon and some of these have, have strong teams as well. But that, that might be a factor in getting him back. But to answer the question, I feel that cuts both ways. We benefited with Odegaard and now maybe Mar Marseille are benefiting now with Saliba. Okay. Okay. Uh, James, Earl says our manager has no man management skills. Well, I'd just like to make two points, if I may, very quickly. Um, first and foremost, on this platform, we like to interact with our viewers and we're grateful for their time and for their attention. Um, Johnny, I'd like to um, I'd like to pose a scenario to Johnny. Uh, you imagine you uh, are um, contacted by a club. They sell it to you. They promise you the earth. You arrive there and it's not quite what you think it's going to be. You you try to find com a compromise. You try to find a common ground. It doesn't quite work out for you. You then return to your homeland to play for the biggest club in that country with a fanatical support. It's like a separate republic, Marseille. As uh, Trevor Stephen, who played for Marseille, former England player, was told by Carlos Mosser, you will never play for a club like this ever again. It's like a separate republic. If you experience that, you're not going to want to return to the place where you was extremely unhappy, are you? 
But as I say, everybody's different. I just wanted to pose that um, that scenario to Johnny and, and let him think about that. And as I say, everyone's got their own opinion. In regards to man management, and I love to um, give a great example. Obviously, not only have I spoken to professional players and managers and uh, technical directors and referees and that kind of thing, but also to assistant managers. And I'm going to reel off a couple of scenarios now as to what exactly an assistant manager does. An assistant manager has to be in a has to be in alignment with the manager in terms of football ethos, in terms of how they want to play the game, and making sure that everything on the periphery is all running smoothly, so that the manager can focus only on football and on, on getting the three points. I, I was fortunate enough to speak to João Orozco, who was assistant to Fernando Santos at Sporting Lisbon. And he was saying to me, James, he said, the one thing I learned from Fernando Santos is how to behave as an assistant manager. Some assistant managers are there in that group and they think they can go and stand in front of Arteta and say, right, we're going to do this, we're going to do that and all that kind of thing. Assistant manager, they have to support the manager. And Stalvin Berg has a uh, past with Feyenoord. He tried his hand at management. It didn't really work out. And I'm convinced that he's only Arteta's assistant because they was on the management course at the same time. Steve Round as well. Obviously, people will know him from Middlesbrough. And I believe he was also at Everton. I think he's got great motivational skills. But I think our backroom staff are just far too similar. I think they're mm. far too similar. And Unai Emery, for example, the, the assistant of Unai Emery, Imanol Diakis, managed a football club in his own right. He managed in, in Cyprus. And he, so he learned about all the different structures of managing abroad. Imina, Imanol Diakos and Unai Emery came together at BLL and BLL won the Europa League due to a great squad and a very comprehensive and very mature backroom staff. I just think our backroom staff is just far too similar. Far, mm. far, far too similar. If Stalvenberg was to leave or Round was to leave, I don't think they'd have a lot of options. I don't even think that Stalvenberg would be um, would be um, in a pole position to get a management job here in the Netherlands. But that's just my personal opinion. But as I say, my insight is completely different to, to those on Arsenal Twitter due to the day-to-day -day running of, of, of what I do with my interviews. But it's also, you try to educate people as well. You try to educate um, people that read your interviews. This is a world game. This is a global game. This global game does not care how many followers someone has. Hmm. This global game doesn't care how much clout or viewers a YouTube has got. They could not care less. The most important thing about this game at the highest level, which our club hopefully participates, the smallest details make the biggest difference. And Arsenal is a football club. I can't quite believe in the 30 plus years that I've been supporting the club, what we have now become. We have now become like a little bit of a sideshow, really, where that one great result heralds a brand new dawn, where that celebrity YouTuber who likes the club gets to speak to the player. But yet the, the journalist, for example, has got to go go to jump through lots of different hoops. And it's, it's just very much a sign of the times. As I say, my, my love of the club is not diminishing, but I don't recognise it anymore. It's like falling in love with a beautiful woman. You know she's naturally beautiful. Nothing, you know, the style, the panache. You can't go into a shop and buy it and they have it in spades. And it's like that lady, that woman losing confidence and make, getting surgery done or getting things done to change themselves where you think you didn't really have to do that, but yet they've decided to do it. And I just think that's the, that's, that's the comparison I make with Arsenal at the minute. We're just, we are not what we used to be. And we seem to think that that one result or that one player signing or that one interaction with a group of fans or a channel is going to make everything all right. Well, as a closing statement, I'm going to repeat what I said earlier. Bayern Munich don't do it. Real Madrid don't do it. Ajax don't do it. And Juventus don't do it. And look at the level they are at to the level we are at. I think it's a different stratosphere. Terry, here's a comment for you. I'll put it to you. Uh, the Assembled says, um, do you think Arsenal are killing players' careers? Their behaviour 
towards professional players is nothing more than atrocious. I'm afraid I, I would agree with that, the way things are going. I mean, we were just saying about the, the sort of backroom team. Yes, we, we read about the Steubenberg and Steve Round and so on, but and there's a lot more, but we, we don't see them. Why not? Why, why doesn't um, Arteta say, when he's doing a press conference, let me get in one of my assistant managers to, to, to field a few questions? Because, you know, as Tim will say, although he was the top man, in, in the Scarif O'Gonolo team, he did listen to, to other people and they could put their, their, their ideas. But if people want to read a really good football book, uh, and it's got a chapter or two about Arsenal, and it's by an Irish guy called Theo Foley, who was George Graham's assistant. And um, I remember when I got first got, got married, uh, uh, my wife was not used to uh, English football and we were playing Oxford, Oxford away uh, in the League Cup. So we, we, we drove over to Oxford and uh, we arrived very early, got into the ground and uh, out come, came Arsenal with Theo Foley, who was uh, Graham's assistant manager. And he kicked the ball around with all the players. And the famous thing was that all the fans knew Theo and they'd sing, Theo, Theo, give us the ball, Theo, <laughs> give us the ball. And eventually at the end of the training session, Theo would kick one ball in, into the crowd, you know. Now, so Theo was the bridge between, if you like, the, the crowd and the team and George Graham, who was quite an authoritarian sort, sort of guy. Now, we should have more of that at Arsenal. Why have we got this? I, I worry that Arteta is a bit autocratic. Yeah. He's, he's got so much on his plate and his head is buzzing with tactical ideas. Absolutely fine. But have somebody else around you that can do another part of it. And it might be, uh, as if you read his book, Theo's book, which is called Give, Give Us the Ball, Theo, um, if, you, know, you can see the way a good assistant manager will dovetail in, but be quite different in the way they handle players and the way they deal with things. That's good. You work in any organisation, and I know schools best, the best senior management team I've seen is where you have two or three or four people, head, deputy, senior teacher, and so on, and they're all quite different. And they've all got slightly different views. Yes, that it, you have to buy into to the ethos of the school. Otherwise, you shouldn't be, be uh, there. But the practicalities, the day-to-day -day running, how you deal with little mini crises and so on, you need a team of people around you. And I do think that we are not, we're not thinking about how these players are feeling. That's a disaster. And as I say, if you look it up, you'll see that Graham Potter has a master's degree in leadership and emotional, uh, you know, uh, support of players. You need people around you who can jump in straight away and know exactly how to deal with those kind of situations. And we, it doesn't look as if we're actually doing that. And we are, sometimes I think we're kind of slightly bullied by players as well, because I've taken quite an interest in, in Balogun. And I watched a lot of his under-23 games, uh, which you can do, uh, not not if if they play at home because Arsenal are one of the few clubs that don't televise their uh, under twenty three games. But a lot of the clubs Arsenal play do. So if they're playing Brighton or Leicester, you can pretend to be a fan, go on, sign up to their website free of charge, and then you can go and see Arsenal's twenty under twenty threes play. And and I haven't seen anything in his play that strikes me anything other than he's quite cocky, and uh, and he's re reasonably quick. But that that's all I've seen. But he's pushed the, the sort of club hard. And I'd love to know what the dynamic is there. Who's pushing who? Because to me, yes, you support your players, but you've also got to put the ball in their hands and say, I want you to show me that you're, that you're worth, uh, you know, paying a pay rise to and so on. So there's a sort of a, there's a double-edged sword here that you want to somehow motivate the players, but you also, when they're in difficulties... Or when things are going too well, you, you need to support them. And I don't see that happening to a degree that uh, I, I would like. In a big organisation, and we are a big organisation, we are still just about a big club. Um, and why aren't we looking after our players like that? When you look behind the scenes, I don't see who the real assistant is. There could be, it could be Steubenberg, it could be Steve Round. 
They've got various other people who do various other things. Arteta needs to loosen the reins. He's, maybe it's because he's under pressure. What heads do in schools, again, I'm sorry to keep coming back to that, but it's the thing, thing I know. When schools get under, under pressure, there's always a danger that the head draws it into him or herself and tries to make the de decisions alone. And that's always a point where it could all go wrong. So I hope that it's not like that at Arsenal. I hope it doesn't go wrong for Arteta. And I hope he most of his major errors that I've been, and mistakes are behind him. But please, let's see more of the backroom team. Let's hear more of which he's got two assistants, I think, is Stoivenberg and Ram. Well, let, let, let's, let's have them in a joint conference alongside Arteta every, every now and again. I want to get Tim's opinion, but uh, very quickly, there's been a comment in the in the live chat. Uh, on a donkey says Arsenal needs to work on making the club more like family to its players and the fans. Strong bonding, so it is important. Daniel, your thoughts? Yeah, well, look, Arsenal. I suppose you talked about yourself there a while ago, Alex. Like Arsenal were uh, obviously North London, very much that part of North London was like a little part of Ireland, actually. Uh, Multi-generational Irish, my father and my granduncle and all those people went over to that part of, of London. I remember, like, um, funny enough, when, when we were doing, when they were showing the bit of the old stadium the other night, I remember walking in front of that, coming up from Arsenal Tube Station with my father. When I was only a young friend, I was very small at the time. But you see, it was kind of eye-catching, but it's still eye-catching. Uh, actually, where the interview took place, there was a, a statue of Herbert Chapman and the, the three people were around the, were around the statue and Carragher and uh, Neville were interviewing him. But yeah, that whole community thing, that's still very much... I felt actually the, the European Super League, one thing that definitely came out of it that was positive was the protests around there, the people were, were still in touch with the club. They let their feelings be known. Um, in other words, they weren't in, although with COVID and everything, there was a, a certain element of risk and all that involved. But like uh, people let the, the local community let their feelings be known that this club was not going to be driven uh, out of North London. It wasn't going to become a franchise. Now, whether that's still, I still think that that, that, that that's European Super League is very much alive. Now, the participants and who's going to be, that's a, 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 a discussion for another day. But uh, ultimately, it is a local club. It is a particularly strong local club. I mean, ultimately, although I suppose Chelsea now with their two European Cups have uh, have kind of maybe uh, kind of taken, but they were traditionally Arsenal were the London club. You know, you had Manchester, you had Liverpool and Arsenal being the, the their, their uh, London equivalents. And they were always to have now... I suppose that mythology even built got even stronger then uh, with the double winning team and the Invincibles and all those type of teams. But like the uh, ultimately that they still have a, a strong foothold, I think, in the community, probably stronger than than the uh, than the other. Well, definitely than Chelsea, I'd say. And I think myself and Terry were discussing something. He sent me a message yesterday. He felt sorry for the Man United players as they went back to Surrey <laughs> and uh, our Manchester United supporters as they made their way back to London or whatever. So it was kind of like that. But Arsenal, I'd say, have a reasonable bond with their community. Now, the one thing I will say in Arteta's favour is that what happened above, like, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is gone now. He's gone. Like, I mean, and there's going to be, like, the conversation has, I'm sure, already started in social media and it will definitely be in all the print media by tomorrow is who is the next... Um, United manager. Well, the one question I would ask is why did he go? What was the, the final straw? What was the thing? And like, I think that he, like, well, what's it? Bullied is the wrong word. He, the pressure came on him. Ronaldo was leaving Juventus. He was going to Man City. Next thing, all these ex players. We had this Les Fer or uh, Rio Ferdinand uh, thing that oh, he was on to on to on the trying to. He was he was the power broker, pure not the waffle like. But uh, that that the next thing Ronaldo had arrived, and he arrived in a team that already kind of it didn't like. I'm not this is going to sound and maybe a little bit uh, cruel, but they actually had got a player in for a position they didn't need. <coughs> United didn't need him. So in other words, it showed a weakness on Solskjaer's <coughs> behalf that he was he was able to be kind of almost coerced into getting this player. Then when he got this player, um, 
he didn't really kind of fit him in either. No, he'd get goals, but his work rate, he doesn't play this pressing game. Like the whole game is changed now. The work rate of players up front has to be colossal. Like they have to be like the most admirable thing the other night from all the attributes was the work rate of Lacazette. And when when Arsenal came up the field, and particularly uh, I'd say with the Smith Rowe goal, they came they came together. <coughs> they all came together. Like Tyrone Mings looked very bad on that goal, but maybe the reason he looked bad is that they were coming at him in waves. He says, Where do I go? What do I stand? Next thing Smith Rowe was inside the box and he was actually able to let him choose which foot he was going to hit the ball with. So in other words, that savage work rate that's required in modern football wasn't being bought by <coughs> this star player who also has an awful lot of Joe Texas in personal management. Joe, they literally had to give him a, the actual number he wanted. He wanted to be number seven. So I felt Arteta maybe is stronger than Solskjaer in that regard. That I think Arteta is showing a bit more strength than Solskjaer. Now, maybe I'll be proven wrong with this at Christmas, but he's still in a job. He's had a couple of good results. Leicester is going to be a very interesting uh, match. With Leicester, with Rodgers, he's kind of been touted as a... You know, every time there's a big vacancy, he's been told that Leicester last season, Joe, were reasonably good, were kind of very much pushing toward the upper half of the division. I think that I'm very interested to see how, how Arsenal are going to get on there. And you must remember, last week, people were saying, um, oh, two home matches. We have Crystal Palace, we have Villa, six points. Next thing, no six points. One, you were, you'd one point after the Crystal Palace, and that was pretty much robbery. But we got it anyway. As the saying goes, we'll take it if it's gone. And but then the pressure did come on him Friday evening. Aston Villa, Armada, they're a reasonably good team, good, very strong up front. Tyrone Mings is a very, very good uh, central defender, and they went at him and took him on. And the only thing about it that I would say, from an Arsenal point of view, was. They deserve their lead of 2 0 at half time and they deserve their win 3 1. But ultimately, there was it was a VAR decision in injury time to get them the second goal. So maybe they're not scoring enough. Maybe the ball, I don't know, is it that the ball isn't being transitioned quick enough or is it just that it's not the chances that aren't, aren't being taken? But that's just to the side. But I think Arteta is mentally or has a, a, a greater picture of where he sees his team going than maybe Solskjaer had at United, and he's now falling his sword. Yeah, can, can I just say about fa family? Very quickly. Very yeah, quickly. just very quickly. Um, in the new stadium, uh, of course, we all had to apply for um, tickets, and sometimes you couldn't get next to, to your friends. And so, it, whereas in the old stadium and in, in, in the days of standing, you could go to where, where, wherever your friends were. So if we do get safe standing, I hope it comes in because it will allow fans to, to congregate, group next to each other and sing mm. and dance and to do what, whatever. And there has been, last season, there was a little, uh, or before COVID, there, there was a guy in my daughter's school, about 17 years of age, I forget the guy's name now, and uh, he used to meet his mates on the concourse below the uh, clock end. And uh, about, about half an hour before every home game, his, his mates would all join arms and uh, sing songs and jump up and down and created the atmosphere in the concourse that we used to have on the uh, terraces. So that's that hopefully would say standing, that kind of thing might might come back. But can I just say to people who've nev never been to an Arsenal match, they're few in this from, from abroad, um, after a game, it's not a very comfortable place to be. Yes, it is if you're in club level at four, four grand a shot, um, but if you're down amongst the hoi polloi, the common rabble, uh, which I was for, for, for decades, after the game, there is nowhere to go. You can go and down and, and get yourself a coffee or a pint, but for most of the season, it's freezing cold. There is deliberately no nowhere to sit. So you're standing on one foot and then, then the other foot. They used to, when we first moved into the Emirates, have a, a stage down under the uh, the East Stand, I think it was. And sometimes you'd have ex-players talk for about half an hour. You'd have Charlie George, Brendan Batson, and they'd chat away and then they'd stop for photographs and stuff like that. So so at least that meant you felt like you, you, you were part of something more than just watching a football club. And after the game now, if you're not in club level, you're, you're basically ushered out onto the streets and there's, there's nowhere nice near the ground to take a friend and and go for a meal, you, you've got to start hiking off maybe for quite a while. So it's not really, fat fam it's not just Arsenal, but but clubs are not family friendly currently. 
Thank you for that, Tell. Um, actually, this last comment here actually leads into the last segment. Um, DWTT says, panel, all of your concerns start at the top and trickle down. New hire at Overmars level and above with similar experiences, only way to change will come. Yeah, bumpy ride. Now, James, uh, over the last couple of days, I've seen some some spurious news. Uh, <laughs> Overmars, Mark Overmars. What's happening with Mark Overmars? He's not going really? to the Newcastle, is he? <laughs> well, first and foremost, he's concentrating on his job in hand at Ajax. Um, I'm privy to be able to understand him in his mother tongue. And when you listen to him in the media, you forget he was a footballer. He did an amazing job at Ajax. He's done an amazing job at Ajax. But let me tell people, he did an even better job at Go Ahead Eagles, who were staring into the abyss. I think a lot of people are coming, um, uh, adding two and two and coming up with five. He is an extremely smart and intelligent person, not just on the pitch, but also off it, also in his uh, personal life with his investments. We'll be taking his time to make the right decision. My final two points tonight, um, I wanted to say about assistant manager. An assistant manager is there to provoke the manager into a different way of thinking. If they don't do that, they leave him on his own. And I don't think that Stalvenberg and Steve Rounds are able to provoke Arteta into another way of thinking. And my final point tonight refers to Graham Potter. Um, I was fortunate enough to interview him in 2018. It was one of my first big interviews that kind of broke through after Danny Cowley when he was Osterston's manager. And um, I'll leave you with a great quote that he said. You know, Terry says about his emotional intelligence. Um, Graham Potter was told by a, a player that transcended football and helped so many people he was told the following advice. Always listen to people and always treat people how you want to be treated. And you know who told him that? Cruyff. No, who? Cyril Johan. Regis. Oh. oh. Cyril wow. Regis, when they were together at West Brom. Oh, wow. <laughs> Cyril Regis. And Cyril Regis, along with Laurie Cunningham, along with Brendan Batson, has transcended football for what they did for so many people. And I think it's marvellous how Graham Potter is, um, is getting the tributes that he deserves. But isn't it wonderful how he's learned from someone who transcended football and is bringing it back now to, uh, to his own things and his own way of thinking? Should we dispense of Arteta? Um, he would be my number one pick. I'm not advocating that we do. But should yeah. we do long term, Absolutely. then he would be my number one pick. I've um, really enjoyed tonight. I hope you all left too. And um, yeah, I look forward to next time. Brilliant. Actually, James, because we're going to wrap it up now. Are, are there any interviews you can talk, us about, talk to us about? Up well, coming? Darren Curry is being extremely well received, especially by Ipswich fans, um, especially when it's released. it was released last Saturday. So I'm really pleased about that. Upcoming interviews include the likes of Brian Tefleden, who was a Dutch um, former sporting director of Reading. And uh, Terry Fennick will, of course, be fast-tracked. Um, today was a real um, a real banner day, really, where you, I started out in Hertha Bosch in the middle of the Netherlands with the then first-team manager of uh, FC Den Bosch, William Flut. And then fast-forward five and a half years, and you've got someone telling you what the atmosphere in the in the changing room was like in the Azteca Stadium before going out to face Diego Maradona's Argentina and facing one of the greatest of all time, what it was like on the pitch. And um, But the, as I say, the great thing, guys, is treating everybody the same. You know, every, every footballer, every manager's got a story to tell. For people, that, for, for fans that think they've got this game sewn up, nothing could be further from the truth. Even as a football fan, you learn Every single day, you learn something that you didn't know before. So, um, yeah, feel free to follow on at James Rowanell and, and um, keep an eye out, eye out for some very interesting interviews. Fantastic. Guys, we'll come to an end. The sixth uh, instalment of uh, the Canon Project. It's good to see uh, Daniel Day-Lewis. And... Yay! Yay! <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Terry, are you going to sing us out? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We won the cup. 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 Brilliant, brilliant. So I will be back tomorrow morning to give some more live news segments and uh, 
and this wonderful channel, uh, Canon for your TV. But before I say my goodbyes, James, really good to have you back uh, on the, the channel. Thank you very much. And of course, to the likely You're lads. Welcome. Likely lads, fantastic, fantastic. Hey, nice guys. Well, until you then, good, you good have time. been watching Canon for the, the channel for Arsenal fans all over this world. We won the cup. We, we won, won the, the cup. cup. Hey, 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 hey.